Well, I will be around uh, this week, but getting prepared for the Bridge Design and Build Contest, it may be sporadic. The only thing I'll say is uh, just send me an email if you have a question. But um, like if you send me 12 emails Friday at 9.45 in the morning when the homework's due at 11, I probably am not going to answer it. So don't wait until the last minute is all I'd say. Okay. What about the text message? All right, all right. Let's talk about shear. Okay, now, look, here's my opinion on shear. Up until now, it's really been an afterthought with a lot of stuff that we've been doing. Like, we've been focusing primarily on VMN being greater than or equal to MU. And then we said, let's focus all our energy on that. Oh, crap, forgot. we got to check this. And it's been an afterthought because in building design, 99 times out of 100, it is an afterthought. But I do want you to have some exposure to the, the means in which you compute the shear capacity of a, uh, of, a, of a W section. And so that's what really today's lecture is all about, is trying to show you how that's done. 99 times out of 100, it is a very, very easy plug and chuck cap. In fact, there are very few instances where it's not uh, in building design. In bridge design, however, shear design can become very tricky very quickly. And I'll, and I'll be able to explain why later, um, but for now, just keep that nugget of thought uh, in your head. Now, to set the stage for what I'm talking about, and I, I'm not going to lie, I'm probably going to gloss over a lot of this derivation because First off, it's the end of the semester, and I know everybody's like, oh, all these, these derivations and whatnot. Um, plus, you, you, you should have seen this before, but here's the thing. Even if you didn't, again, shear design for buildings is not really, and when we're talking about steel, it's not really that big of a deal. It is for concrete design, but not for, for steel. It just sort of doesn't end up being a, a big deal. So to sort of explain where this is coming from, so I, I want to, first off, get to this place right here. How many of you have at least seen this formula before? It's some way, shape, or form. I know a few of you have seen it. Should, everybody should have seen it. I want to explain from a 30,000 foot view uh, where this formula comes from. So I want to talk about this beam right here. So I have a beam that is subjected to a point load at mid span. So would you agree that the shear diagram looks something about like this and the moment diagram looks something about like this? That should be pretty straightforward. Okay? I'm using this beam for a very, very specific reason. Because if I cut out a very specific section, or actually uh, not a specific section, an arbitrary section, if I cut out any arbitrary section uh, out of this beam, what tends to happen uh, is this. I tend to have a section that has a variable bending moment. In other words, it has a different bending moment on the left side of the section as I do on the right side of the section, but I have a constant shear. So the shear is constant, but the moment is variable. The thing is, that's kind of hard to avoid. Remember, what is the derivative of the moment with respect to x? Anybody remember what that is? That's the shear. So if shear is a constant, If shear is a constant, then moment has to be variable. It has to change. There's, there's really not, not much way of getting around that. Um, but fortunately, this beam sort of serves as a really nice um, a really nice example because we have a constant shear. Okay. Now, I got a lot going on in this slide, and I want to simplify it as much as possible. So. What I have here is a, a, a beam, and we're going to say it's B wide and H tall. So let me go back, let me go back here. When I say that the, the beam is H tall, I'm talking about this height here. And when I say it's B wide, I'm not talking about this width, I'm talking about this width, in and out of the screen. You know? Samurai sword or lightsaber through the section, and it's H tall, but the width is this way, right? In and out of the in and out of the screen. So if I were to investigate that little dx element, it's going to look something like this. It's dx wide, it's h tall, but it's b wide in and out of the screen. Everybody okay with that? 
Now, like I said, I'm going to gloss over a lot of stuff in this derivation, but there's a couple things I want to indicate. So would you agree that given my isometric art skills uh, as, as good as possible, would you agree that over here on the left, this is kind of what the bending stress profile looks like, right? Sigma equals my over i, it's zero at the centroid, we've got you know, linear up from that, so maybe compression up here, tension down here. Would you agree with that? That's about what the bending stress profile is going to look like on the left. That's about what it's going to look like on the right. But what's going on with the values? I've got sigma over here, and I've got sigma plus some increment of stress on the right. Why is there the change? Well, the reason for the change is because of this, right? I have a bending moment here on the left and a bending moment here on the right, and they're not the same, okay? They're going to be different. I'm going to have a different amount of stress on the left than I do on the right, okay? There's no, no way around that, okay? So what happens? Like, like, like how, do I, how, how do I, you know, how do I square this up? See, if I sum forces in the x direction, would you agree that everything going to the left has to equal everything going to the right? That's just, otherwise, the beam's going to be running away from you, okay? That's, that's the facts. So, the problem is, is that I've got, you know, some amount of stress over here on the left, some amount of stress over here on the right, and they're not equal to one another. So, if I sum forces in the x direction, something's going to be imbalanced, right? It's not going to equal one another. So, how, how do I get around that? How do I figure that out? Well, here's how I figure that out. I have here a book, okay? Let me move this up here. Now, when I take these pages and I bend them, they just sort of bend like this, right? And the pages slide off of one another, right? They're not like glued together or taped together. I'm not really bending one beam as much as I'm bending hundreds of really, really thin beams. Would that be a fair statement? Each page is sort of acting as its own beam. Now, the, the, it has the same moment of inertia, B wide and H tall, but they're sliding away from one another. They're really, really easy to bend. Well, how would this change if I sat here for a few hours or a day or a week or however long it takes and I glued all these pages together? I'm being serious. Let me ask you a question. If I glued all these pages together, do you think I would very easily be able to do that? No, right? That'd be pretty tough, right? In other words, I mean, it, instead of bending a hundred little beams, it would be like bending one really big beam. I say what you will, paper is in a roundabout way made of wood. So it'd be like bending a piece of wood that's yay thick. I wouldn't be able to do that to it, would I? No, absolutely not. Okay, here's what's going on with this, with this derivation. If I sum forces in the x direction, they're imbalanced. Okay, they're unbalanced because there's more force on one side than there is on the other. So, but if sum of forces in the x direction has to be equal to zero, then that force has got to go somewhere. Where does it go? It goes in that interface between the pages. So let me skip ahead a couple of slides. Ignore the math for right now. See, what's happening is between those pages, I'm developing a shear stress. The pages are wanting to slide together. They're wanting to slide apart. Well, if I were to sit there and glue them all together, that wouldn't happen. Those pages would be stuck together, right? See, I propose that what's going on is that in between those layers, in between those layers that there's a shear stress being developed, okay? And the force generated is the stress times that area, B times that differential element, dx, okay? And if I sum forces in the x direction, set them equal to zero, and integrate all of my stresses, and plug and chug, and I'm not going to make you go through all the math, but plug and chug, and I get this formula, okay? Now, I'm not going to make you go through and do all that, that derivation. It's there. You can review it uh, to your heart's content. Uh, that, that, that's not really the purpose of this class, but I have it there in case you, you'd like to review it. But this is the formula that you get, and it's a function of four quantities. So first off, it's a function of the shear, which along a given section can be taken to be constant. Okay? In other words, I samurai sword or a lightsaber along a given section, shear is constant. Okay? 
It's a function of I, which is the moment of inertia. which can also be taken to be constant along a given section. I cut a section, look at the beam, here's the beam. I can solve for the moment of inertia pretty easily. Anybody who's had me for concrete design or, or for 216 or anything like that, parallel axis serum, you know how to solve for, uh, for moments of inertia. That's not a big deal. Not a big deal. Now Q is what's called the first moment of area. Now that's variable as you go up and down the beam, but the other one is the beam width. Okay. Now to sort of explain what happens in steel design, and this is where this, this becomes pretty relevant, I'd like to look at these two beams right here. Okay. Now the beam up top is a rectangular section, really straightforward. The moment of inertia, just BH cubed over 12, pretty easily, pretty easy to compute. Okay? The shear is constant, the, the moment of inertia constant, but the big thing to keep in mind is that the width is constant. In other words, this B value, this distance from here to here is always the same. Whether I'm at the very, very bottom, the very top, or everywhere in between, that distance from end to end is always the same. Okay? Now, what's variable, what makes this a varying function is this value Q. See, you all are used to the bending stress, and the bending stress looks like that. Okay? The shear stress formula, the shear stress plot looks something about like that. And the reason why it looks like that is because of Q. Okay? That's not really the, 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 the big thing I'm trying to get across. The big thing I'm trying, the big message I'm trying to get across to you right now is what happens here. See, what happens here is the width changes. So we have a large width, large width, large width, and then bam, the width suddenly changes. We go from having a really, really wide beam to a really, really thin one, and it suddenly changes right there. Does that make sense? Now, let's look at the formula. When B suddenly gets smaller, what happens to the shear stress? If this value right here suddenly gets smaller, what happens to this? It gets larger. So when you look at the shear stress plot for, say, an I-beam versus a rectangular section, what happens for a rectangular section is you have this pretty, like, rounded, you know, you know, nonlinear plot, but for I beam, something very, very significant happens. You have very, very little shear stress in the flanges, but in the web, you have a crazy amount of shear stress because the beam width suddenly changes. So because the beam width suddenly changes, the shear stress in the web jumps up like crazy. The reason, the big thing I want to get across to you is that when we look at shear design in steel, we can pretty much completely ignore the flanges and all we have to look at is the web. There's, a, there's an old adage in steel design is that the flanges pretty much determine the moment capacity and the web determines the shear capacity. Well, here's why. Okay. Does that make sense? I, yeah, I'm not going to go through the derivation. You should have seen that before and I'm not, that's not really my, my, my focus for today. I just want to make sure that you kind of understand how I'm going from this fundamental equation to this plot here. Very good? Okay, then let's talk about shear capacity, okay? Because we've been glossing over this for far too long, and I feel that it's necessary to kind of explain what, uh, what we're talking about. Okay, so in general, we have two primary concerns regarding shear capacity. We have shear yielding, and we have shear buckling. Now let me see, I'm sort of doing this on the fly. I'm going to Microsoft Edge and I'm typing in Google. Are you kidding me? Okay. Okay. So when we're talking about shear buckling, this is actually a not this is a pretty good image. 
We're talking about what happens when the web is buckling in shear. So for those of you in uh, concrete design, when you have a concrete beam that, uh, that undergoes cracking in shear, what angle does it crack at? 45 degrees. Why does it crack at 45 degrees? Worst case on more circle. Worst case on more circle, right? More circle says that when you have a 45 degree orientation, one axis is experiencing tension, one axis is experiencing compression. Well, in steel design, things in compression like to buckle. So what's happening right here, if you look at, let's say, let me see if I can draw on the screen. If, if you look, oh, hold on, I'm going to copy this. This, this is actually, um, this is important. I'm, I'm going to put this on. Okay. So what's happening here, if you all want the, the concrete design or the more circle analogy, what's happening here is you're getting tension this way, but in this direction, you're getting compression. So what's happening is in that direction, it's buckling and it's essentially folding in that direction. Does that kind of make sense? So that, that's, that's what, when we're looking at shear capacity, we're really looking at one of two things. We're either looking at yielding of the web or we're looking at buckling. Now, let's take yielding first because that's, that's the easy one. Now, let's go back to an earlier part in the class. Um, when you have something in shear, what's its maximum uh, uh, capacity? It's the yield stress times this certain magic number. Does anybody remember what that number is for shear? 0.6, right? Remember that whole von Mises yielding criterion and we said that anytime we're dealing with something that's in pure shear, there's going to be a 0.6 that pops up? Well, that's exactly what's happening here. When we're looking at capacity in shear, the way that the spec works is we take the, the full plastic capacity of the web, which is 0.6 times Fy times the area of the web, and then we adjust it by this buckling coefficient. So What's the area of the web? Well, it's the depth times the web thickness. Don't worry, I've got an example showing you how this is going to work. It's pretty straightforward. Now, when we compute the shear capacity, we have to determine whether or not buckling is going to happen. And that's actually a pretty straightforward assessment. Um, we take H over TW and we compare it to a couple of limits. Now, the first limit that we compare it to is whether or not the web can be considered fairly compact. And if it is, we say that our feed value is 1 and our buckling coefficient is 1. So if this limit is true, we take that to be 1, we take that to be 1, and it takes 2 seconds to compute the capacity. If that's not the case, we have to compute CV and uh, phi is taken to be 0.9. The only other question we have to ask is whether or not the web is stiffened or not. So this previous image that I just showed you, just so everybody's clear, those plates that are going this way along the section are called stiffeners, okay? So they sort of are akin to stirrups in a reinforced concrete beam. But I, I want to be clear, the mechanics are wildly different. I say they're akin to, um, to stirrups because they're placed in a very similar fashion. You're going to have a lot of stirrups near the end, not so many stirrups in the middle because the end is where you have your high shears the middles where you have your high moments. So if you look at any bridges out there, you're going to tend to find less shear stiffeners in the middle than you are uh, near the supports. Now, so what I mean by a stiffened versus an unstiffened web, an unstiffened web is where we don't have any stiffeners at all, which is going to be most, uh, which is going to be what we see most of the time uh, in buildings. For bridges and, and, you know, in some cases with buildings, very, very rarely, but uh, in bridges, whenever you see those stiffeners, those are stiffened webs. So just so everybody's clear on that. So what I'm going to do here in a second is go through a couple of examples explaining how to compute shear capacity. It's really easy. Uh, to compute uh, that shear buckling coefficient, we have to compute the shear strain coefficient and this uh, web plate buckling coefficient. We just take that to be a constant value whenever we're dealing with an unstiffened web. If any of this math is, if it's lost in every, trust me, it's, uh, it's really easy. As for computing CV, again, really, really plug and chuck. It's either going to buckle or it's not, and if it doesn't uh, buckle, CV is 1. So let me, let me just show you 
So I have here this final example in the notes on how to compute the shear capacity for a typical W shank. For those of you who are breaking out your notebooks and, and wanting to write this stuff down, don't worry, you really don't need to. If you go on the Blackboard and go under the, the lecture notes, I've posted this PDF. This is, this is on the web right now. So I just want to show you how this works because it's really easy. Okay. So let's take a W24 by 76, and I want to show you how you compute the shear capacity. Now, while I'm showing you, or before I show you, why don't everybody turn to table 3-2 and tell me what the shear capacity is. What is PDB and X4A um, for a 24 by 76? Like the last week, hopefully everybody brought their AISC 15th edition steel construction manual within class. It's like the last day. Looking for fee, VV, and X for a 24 by 76. 315 kits. Does everybody see that? Right here. Now I'm going to show you how they computed that value. So if you look up the properties for a 24 by 76, you're going to get a depth of 23.9 inches, a web thickness of 0.44, and then an H over TW of 49. Remember, H over TW, that's sort of the slenderness ratio for the web. Now if you have a sufficiently compact web, this is pretty easy. You take 2.24 times the square root of E over FY, so 2.24 times that limit is 53.9, and you compare this to that. So this is the limit. This is what you actually have. If your web slenderness is less than this limit, then B is 1 and CV is 1. I'll go ahead and tell you that for probably about 95% of the shapes in the manual, that is going to be the case. And when that is the case, your capacity is really, really easy to uh, calculate. All you do is you take 0.6 times Fy times the area of the web, which is the depth times the thickness, times Cv. And so that's 315.48. Phi is 1. So that's your Phbn. And what did the, the manual list? 315. It, it, I'm telling you, it's that easy. Okay. <coughs> and the reason for this derivation that I showed you is because I wanted you to recognize why we're only looking at the web. Okay, we're only looking at the capacity of the web because it's the capacity of the web that determines the capacity of the girder. That's that's why we're ignoring everything else. Does that make sense? Now, this is a, a really really easy one. I'm going to be honest. I had to get really really creative to try and come up with a problem that would be tricky. See this W30 by 90. It's H over TW is 57.5. It is actually the most slender web section in the entire manual. Okay? So if you go to the manual and you sort uh, sections by H over TW, this is literally the most slender shape that there is. And even with that, the capacity is still pretty easy. I had to bump its FY up to 65 KSI to make the problem interesting, if that makes any sense. Like I had to. It's almost like I had to fudge it to make it interesting. Like that, that, that's, how, that's how easy shear capacity really is. Now, for a W30 by 90, what happens is this. So here's its depth, here's its web thickness, here's its H over TW. When you compute that compactness limit, you find the opposite, that the web is actually more slender than this limit. When that's the case, you take your V value to be 0.9, but your CV has to be computed. So the way that you do that is you take KV to be 5.34. That's always the value whenever you have a web that's unstiffened. If you have stiffeners, this K value goes up. But whenever you don't have any stiffeners, that's taken uh, as a constant. Next thing that you do is you compute whether or not the web is going to buckle. So how do you determine whether or not the web is going to buckle? You compute 1.1 times the following ratio, times the square root of the following ratio, and compare that to this. Since our web is actually more slender than this limit, that means that the web is actually going to buckle. How do you determine that? 
Just calculate C sub B, and then it's plug and chuck. I, I'm, I'm really trying to indicate that this is easy. I, this is about as complicated as it gets. I, I can't make it any more complicated. You, keep in mind, you don't have to do this on the, on the homework. So. And I'm not going to make you do the math on the exam. I do want you to understand where this is coming from. And I want you to understand generally the behavior. I do have one other thing I want to show you today, which actually might help you on the exam if you're interested in, in, in looking at it. But does anybody have any questions on this? All right. This is the last thing I want to show you in here. I want everybody to turn to table 6-2. Six, 6-2. Two. Six two. This is if you're interested. This is not mandatory. This is just something I want to show you if you're interested. Let's just use 6-63 as a reference. 6-63. I just just to, for the heck of it. So if it's something a little different than what's on the screen. Okay. How many of you remember, let's go back a little bit to the um, Table 4-1 that we used for when we were designing columns. Remember, we would say, okay, here's your KL and the y-axis, here's your load. But we would find those representative shapes. How many of y'all remember that? Okay. Well, that was the column design aid. This is a new aid. This is actually brand new. They just added this aid to this edition of the main. And AISC is coming up with a clever little name for this design aid. They're calling it the super table. Okay. And so, let me explain what's going on with this uh, super table. So, let's take a look at page 6-63. Okay? So, take a look at what's going on on the left side of that page and what's going on on the right side of that page. So, if you look, you should see three sections on the left side. So, here on the screen, I have a 140, 14 by 145, 14 by 132, 14 by 120. But then the same sections are on the right side of the page, the 145, 132, and the 120. Now, as you go down, you should be seeing that those numbers are decreasing. Okay? So, what's happening is as the length is increasing, the capacities are going down. On the left side, what you're seeing are column capacities. This is VPN, VPN, VPN for each of these shapes. So as the distance between those column segments are getting larger, the capacity is going down. But on the right side, we're looking at moment capacity. So this is VMN, VMN, VMN as the LB is getting larger. So it's all in one place. And as for what else is on this table, look at the bottom left. We have the tensile capacity for each of these sections, for gross section yielding, for net section fracture, assuming that our effective area is 75% of the gross area. We have the shear capacity for each of these sections. We have the LP. We have the LR. We have all the moments of inertia. We have the RX over RY ratio. We have it all. Everything all in this one table. There's a lot going on here, but it can kind of serve as a shortcut if you're trying to look up a whole bunch of values all at once. It's just, I'm not making you do it, and I'm not making you use it. It's just something to think about because there's a lot here and there's a lot less flipping and turning. So. Now, a couple things to keep in mind. So, all of these moment capacities. Um, are for CB equals 1, so if CB doesn't equal 1, you have to figure that out. Um, the axial capacities are based off the weak axis, so if you're looking at the strong axis, you're going to have to do that, what is it, that KX, LX over the ratio of RX over RY, y'all remember that for columns, it's the same story. Um, again, all your 
uh, moments of inertia here. The LP and the LR values are here as well. Um, there's, it's like all here in this one table. To be honest, I think it's too much to use like at once, which is why I'm showing you at the end. Like I'm not showing you this throughout the, the beginning because this is a lot. There's a lot going on here. Um, but it's a pretty useful aid. It's just something to keep in mind. Um, if I'm correct, uh, if you go online, like on the AISC's website, you can actually download additional table 6-2s or if you had different yield strengths, different FYs and FUs and things like that. Uh, but it's, it's worth checking out. I think it's a pretty useful aid. I'll say this in practice, I probably used to say all the time, but in teaching, not so much because there's, it, it's, it's pretty intense. There's a lot of crap going on on the page all at once. And so I think it's pretty intimidating sign aid. Hopefully now that you know where a lot of these values are coming from, it's a little less intimidating. Are there any questions? All right, so I'm ending probably a little early. I want to make sure everybody's clear on a couple things. First off, I'm not making you do the sheer stuff on the exam or the homework assignment. I just think it's worthwhile that you know where it's coming from. Uh, check out the super tables if you're interested. Logistics. We have homework due on Friday. I need it on Friday. I will give you the solution that Friday, so no late assignment. Then that's our last class. Can't really accept much late work after that anyways. Finals next week. I want you all prepared to ask questions about the final on Friday. No class Wednesday. Everybody good? That's all I got. Whoa, 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 whoa. Tuesday, Tuesday and here. Monday, concrete, right? Tuesday, 10, 15, right? That's all I got. Oh, if anybody's interested in helping out with that bridge